Hi, this is Jennifer, Mike Solis. Uh, this is Jennifer Solis. Mike is not going to be with us. Um, he has been silenced by a federal judge. Uh, this is our Nevada Cannabis News Hour, and we're here to talk about the local news and all of the news in the nation that is about cannabis. I'd like to say happy Earth Day to everybody. It's Earth Day 2014. My guests in studio today are Kurt Dukoch and William Beach Baker. Uh, I'd like to start out by talking about some of the deadlines and uh, some of the meetings that are today. Uh, as you all know, the Clark County deadline for today uh, application is at 3 p.m. today. I will tell you that, you know what? There were plenty of people in the all-night kinkos copying and copying and copying for binders. Uh, I met somebody that was up until 5 a.m. this morning copying all night because they didn't get to kinkos before 10. Uh, what do you got to say about that, Kurt? Yeah, I was, I was watching uh, like uh, some of the lawyers coming in that were turning in multiple applications, and they were they were literally had like twelve to fourteen boxes for each lawyer, you know, bringing in their application. So it was a lot of paperwork, you know, for this Earth Day. <laughs> that that's a good point. It was a lot of paperwork for uh, for Earth Day. There was a lot of binders involved. Uh, I had I had a. Um, I was at my lawyer's office and, and somebody came over there and they were begging for help. And so I, I stayed and I helped, you know, collate some binders with them. But, you know, it was approaching like three o'clock. They had to send somebody down to just to sit on the line so that we could finish up their binders for them. You know, what is up with people waiting until the last minute, stoners? <laughs> well. I think it was just there was so much paperwork to get done that they to to put a decent application in you had to wait till the last minute there was you know there's still probably stuff they want to add to their applications just couldn't get in there they were busily typing you know until last night well uh two other deadlines that we have um or meetings that we have are north las vegas city council meeting tonight at 6 p.m uh, the speaker on that is Tick Seerbloom, and he is our state senator, and he is also the person that championed the SB 374 through legislature. And we have a City of Las Vegas meeting at 6 p.m. also, and this is just for public comments. Your The best bang for your buck would probably be going to North Las Vegas, um, you know, to see what's happening that is new in the cannabis industry, because the City of Las Vegas, it just sounds like that um, the public comments are people that are you know, complaining or, or going to, you know, say that there's something uh, wrong with the bill or, you know, you know, or just have some suggestions. Or you always get those people up there that are completely uninformed and they say, you know what, I think that we should have legal cannabis in this state. It's like, okay, next. Um, if you want the address for North Las Vegas uh, meeting tonight at 6 p.m., it's 2250 North Las Vegas Boulevard. Uh, and again, Tick Siegerbloom is going to be the speaker on that. Uh, we have a, a speaker from, uh, we have a guest from California. He's a California cannabis attorney, and his name is Mark uh, Mark Terbeek. Mark, are you there? I am. Thank you for having me on again, Jen. Welcome to the show, Mark. You're welcome. Thanks, Kurt. Um, do you have any comments about North Las Vegas meetings or Clark County or any of the, any of the deadlines that are going on here in, in Nevada? Well, you know, it, it's interesting. Uh, starting out with the Clark County deadline, um, they're... I can understand why some people uh, were hesitant to move forward. There has been some concern about the openness of the Clark County process, and then uh, some pushback against some of that has taken a place. There's been some views that maybe uh, there's some openings that uh, might not have been there before, so people were rushing in. And then, of course, there's the people that uh, just push things to the last minute not even because they're necessarily stoners, I'm but because sorry. they're just people who push things to the last minute. Lawyers are notorious for doing that. <laughs> really? Are you guys it, known for procrastination? We, we, it, it's far stock and trade. <laughs> <laughs> as far as the city of Las Vegas goes, okay. uh, I, I've looked at that proposal, and my concern about the city of, of Las Vegas is this public comment that they are having tonight. Sure. Um, maybe just window dressing. It's We'll hear what you have to say, but we're going to move forward with our proposal anyway. Uh, I hope that's not the case. The uh, prior public comments that uh, I've been privy to, although I've not been physically present at, my uh, people I have uh, uh, been working with have been there, uh, moved along the same direction. But North Las Vegas appears to be much more promising, at least based on my 
discussions with Council Member Barone, who is spearheading the effort in North Las Vegas. He's very open to a transparent, merits-based process that uh, allows the, the best, most qualified applicants to rise to the top uh, without putting ridiculous restrictions uh, on the ability of these businesses to operate. And he's a good union person, too. Uh, I, I support the union in this, so uh, I think that's a good sign. Uh, and it occurs to me that uh, North Las Vegas may just turn out to be the best location for cannabis business in the Las Vegas Valley. You know, it, it, it is kind of looking that way. Um, you, you know, some of the city of Las Vegas... Um, their their proposed regulations on this. I, I, I was in the first meeting. I, I I didn't go to the second meeting. I was I was working. But in the first meeting, like immediately, there were at least fifteen things that were just like this is absurd. This is crazy. Do you think that these uh, these are just tactics to kind of stymie people, or or do you think it's really they want to build some kind of robust kind of regulations and and they think that you know they're that's the best thing to do. It's hard to know on some level. Uh, I mean, I suspect that um, the vice mayor's hand in, is in some of this, who is uh, substantially committed to opposing cannabis in any form other than to imprison people for its use. And there's a couple of provisions in there that look like poison pill stuff, where uh, it was inserted at the behest of somebody who did not want the ordinance to work. And then there's some other provisions, and I'm particularly concerned about the uh, exorbitant fee structure for even applying that uh, are meant, it, it appears designed to frustrate uh, applicants from applicants who don't have already a lock in on things, if you know what I mean, frustrate their ability to make an application. Because if you're looking at between seventy five and $100,000, depending on what the size of your facility is, or more just to apply. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People aren't going to risk that kind of capital when you're also having to put out a substantial additional sum to put together the application in the first instance. They're going to be loath to risk that unless they are pretty sure that they're going to get an application. So the mere the size of those fees is troubling to me. And I'm not quite sure what to make of it if it's just an experience or if there's something else going on. You know, that's that's always been my concern is, you know, that even up in legislature, um, when the original SB 374 uh, was was being discussed and being read, that it, it started out like as one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars liquid assets. And then as soon as people started complaining that one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in liquid assets was too much, they raised it to two hundred and fifty. Um I don't know whether that was, you know, it was a, in a direct answer to that. Like, you know, see, guess what? You thought that was too much? You know, you're really going to like this amount. Um, or, or, or it was just, or it was just, they thought that the cost of doing business for a can of business uh, to get started was $250,000. But I, I really don't think it is that much. I mean, in California and some friends that I've had in Colorado had said that they didn't spend nearly that much getting their can of business going. You can go and buy one in California for about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars and just take it over at this point. Is that a pre ICO one? Yes. Wow. Yeah, but you have so much competition in California. There, there are there are a lot of dispensaries there, and so I don't know. I guess what would you re, you know your return on investment be, and in, and in, is it doing well? I think it, it depends on the nature of the dispensary you want. Uh, there are. There are any number of business forms that you can have in any given industry that are shoestring uh, to bells and whistles. I know that one of my clients in, in Oakland, who's running a successful dispensary now, uh, their uh, just build out was $100,000 on a facility that they have that's both a dispensary and a, and a grow. Uh, and the build out on that was just 100000 in and of itself. Um, not to mention all the other security and other uh, overhead that they had to put into it. So it really depends. If you're really looking at a top-notch facility, a real top-grade facility, putting out pharmaceutical-grade or really medical-grade cannabis, uh, it can get expensive. Uh, and I guess the question is, is uh, 
should there be room, and it's a question for the public to answer in any given state or jurisdiction, is should there be room for shoestring operations that just provide basic service uh, as well as uh, bells and whistles operations that have uh, every different variety and varietal that you can think of under the sun. Well, you know, I'm maybe I'm just being naive about this, Mark, but I mean, don't can't people get business loans to build out their buildings and and do all of this type of stuff, or do business loans for cannabis um, not exist? Well, let me put this way: the Small Business Administration definitely does not give out business loans for cannabis businesses, and uh, ordinary financial institutions such as banks or federally chartered banks uh, and and federally chartered any federally chartered institution uh, is highly unlikely to underwrite a loan uh, for uh, a cannabis business. So it's really difficult to get traditional funding sources through banks and, and, uh, and those type of outfits for loans, forcing people to turn to hard money lenders. And in that regard, uh, interest and the terms can be stiff, shall we say. Okay. All right. Um, you know, I think that uh, also that I heard actually part of this big rush today um, was about that on Friday there were only about 46 applications or 42 applications, something like that turned in. And so when people thought, people were like, oh, only 42 applications? I have a shot. I have a shot. Um, I think that's right. You think that's correct? I think that is. I think when people were hesitant, they thought they were going to be overwhelmed or they were going to be shut out. And then just right at the 11th hour, uh, that perception changed. I know so, uh, we certainly were going to take bets uh, or we were not going to take bets or even do a contest on how many can of businesses or how many applications were turned in. And at the beginning of this, we were all guessing, oh, 1,100 or you know, 300 or 500. And when that number just really didn't materialize, it, it, was, it was kind of surprising to me as, as much scuttlebutt as I heard about, you know, people coming to town, people are coming to town. It was like people are coming to town, but everybody was window shopping. Nobody was buying. Well, you know, not all of them were buying. Exactly. I mean, there was window shopping is a good metaphor for it. I've talked to Many, many, many people who expressed an interest and were happy to take up my time in talking uh, every third detail that they could imagine. But when it came time to actually funding the operation or putting up the money to prepare, to actually prepare in a timely fashion the application process, uh, people all of a sudden they were shuffling and whistling Dixie and what have you, but, uh, but not coming forward with what they needed to come forward with. I, w I will have to tell you, in the months leading up to this, I I've gained some weight because so many people wanted to take me out to lunch to talk. <laughs> the, yeah. let's, let's go yes, talk. Let's, let's, let's go. Uh, you know, there was a certain point where I just reached the point where I'm like, listen, I'm fat already. If you want to talk, let's just talk. Pay me. <laughs> there you go, because I, I got a lot of free dinners, but the free dinners didn't turn out to be worth the time that I spent talking to everybody for the, the free dinners, a $15 dinner, getting three or four hours of uh, direction on it, um, turns out to be a good deal for them. Uh, and even then, it was difficult for most people to really pull the trigger and move forward with the funding on, on how they needed to move forward with the process. Well, you know, and then we had to, I, I know I, I myself had to take tactics like, you know what, I just have an hour to kill. I have another meeting that I'm going to, and I, I've just got an hour for you guys, so let's talk quickly and get this, you know, and, and, and let me find out what the gist of your of your, um, of your your issue is. And, and that, that speeded everything up, but, you know, as, as far as people, you know, pulling the trigger and wanting to actually, you know, have an, uh, have an application, I would say that out of the, out of the, 20 or so people that I met with, I think maybe less than a handful of those actually went forward with applications. Uh, yeah, exactly. I probably talked to at least 20, and, and none went forward with applications in Clark County. And one of the interesting things that's going to burble up now, because everybody's got their applications in, and, uh, is going to be the uh, agreements that people entered into with the groups mm -hmm. that they entered into them with mm -hmm. uh, once things start get up and running, they're going to actually have to look at those agreements and see how they really play out in the real world. And I bet you there's going to be some dispute resolution needed for some 
or many of those agreements. Wow. Yeah. Um, are you talking about maybe the like board members, or are you just talking about maybe equity partners, or just the whole well, thing in general? The whole thing in general, because there's a lot of these groups came and they formed and, and they went forward, and, and there were some groups that I worked with that fell apart, and, and they reconstituted, and, and there's a whole general concept out there of, of I want in the I want in this, but I want in it with other people's money. So people yeah. are doing this, they're doing that, they're doing the other thing. There are people who are funding it, and people who are managing it, um, and uh, agreements, particularly at the last minute. I can just envision, I can just see this happening, groups coming together, getting something in under the deadline, getting some sort of, of agreement that, that they, they're, they're shoehorned into it or they're presented and they don't have time to think about it and really vet it and think all the consequences through and see how it works in the real world. And, and what you need on that one is a, is a cannabis lawyer who's litigated cannabis issues. Though only those lawyers or only those consultants can see how it plays out in litigation. But people are doing this. They're doing it blindly. And at some point, when the rubber hits the road and and the revenues start coming in, uh, there may be some issues concerning that. There will be issues of control, issues of revenue sharing, uh, issues of payment uh, for employment, all that sort of stuff. It it just – because here's the thing about cannabis business. It's like any other business. Mm -hmm. So these things happen in every other business. They're going to happen in this business. We're going to have to go uh, on a break right now. And um, after the break, we'll join Mark Terbeek and Kurt Dukach back in the studio. We'll see you in a minute. Did you know that over 100,000 people in America are dying on an annual basis due to prescription medications? Yet marijuana has been around for 10,000 years and used as a medical resource and has never been known to kill a human being ever. But yet, we're not utilizing this great medication. Here at Karma's Holistic Health Foundation, it is our sole purpose to get you to your medicine as quickly as possible, all while following the state of Nevada's laws. Please call us today and we will get you your medical marijuana card at 702-388-1119. 702-388-1119 or visit us online at get medical marijuana now.com thank you weekend 702 is a nevada cannabis community we are a 501c3 nonprofit that meets in southern nevada we are a social group that started in las vegas for patient support we've been active in the community for over five years if you'd like to join us on any of our events or parties Please contact us through Facebook at WeCan702, on Meetup at www.meetup.com forward slash WeCan702. Our website is www.wecan702.org. Be a part of the Nevada Cannabis Reform Revolution. Please join us and donate today. Welcome back. Uh, it's time for our 420 moment. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're gonna we're gonna do a weekend celebrity spotlight today. Today we're gonna give the spotlight to Whoopi Goldberg. She came out and said she fell in love with her vape pen. It's a true story. Really, I know somebody <laughs> in love with their vape pen. <laughs> yep. She made her de- uh, debut in the Cannabis Denver's Post. It's a spinoff dedicated to a uh, weed site on Thursday morning, with a loving column column dedicated to Sippy. Her reliable vape pen. Zippy. <laughs> yep. She's, uh, Whoopi does not just wander around the streets of L.A. and New York casually smoking weed because weed is cool and fun and rebellious, just like Whoopi. She is an adult with real medical concerns. Whoopi loves her vape pen because of her ability to help her live life more comfortably with glaucoma makes one of these more important figures in my day-to-day, she writes. And yes, I named it Sippy because I take tiny little sips. Sassy sip season. <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, that was our that was our new um, weekend 420 ce- uh, celebrity spotlight. If you'd like to call in uh, and and tell us your comments, you can give us a call at seven zero two seven three one one two three zero or eight six six eight two zero five five two eight. So give us a call and um, tell us your comments for today. Let's let's hear what you have to say about cannabis in general. I'd like to next. Um, talk about how 
cannabis has come a long way since last 420 and some of the major milestones uh, that have happened in here in America. I think the first one that we should discuss is Colorado uh, sold legal re- uh, recreational marijuana for the first time. Do you know how much money they generated in the first month? No, how much? It was $14 million. So those tax revenue. That's just in tax revenue. That's just in tax revenue. These millions were brought in by only 59 marijuana businesses that were able to get through the application process. And that just represents a fraction of the 550 outlets in the state that's el- that are eligible for retail license. I read somewhere, too, that the uh, college tuition went up 15% right after they uh, legalized it for adult recreational use. Well, that's because everybody wants to go uh, go to school in the Mile High City. <laughs> <laughs> They'll probably be much smarter students, too, because they won't be out getting drunk all night long. Quite possibly, quite possibly, and some of those ADD students will be able to study. Um, a recent survey in the public policy polling uh, shows that 50 per se- 57% of Colorado voters now approve marijuana legalization. Well, that's good because it's already legal there. While 35% disapproved um, of the Amendment 64. And it passed by only a 10-point margin. The second point I'd like to talk about, um, the promise of medical cannabis continues to grow. It's not just been medical use for adults or responsible use for adults that have taken the highlight in these past months it's a lot of a lot of children with epilepsy a lot of children that have seizures multiple seizures hundreds of seizures a day Uh, this has come out um, you know with Sanjay Gupta's CNN special but we were in city council and they played a film about some children that were having seizures in Utah and the CBD um, tincture that they're now allowed and bringing those high CBD strains to Nevada so a lot of these promises you know of of stuff to come you know are are really about children about medical use about responsible use and the FDA is moving forward with an orphan drug designation for cannabis-based drug called Epidolix, and it, it fights severe forms of childhood epilepsy. It's the Epidolix maker has to demonstrate the efficacy of the drug in clinical trials to win FDA approval, but it's still a high CBD tincture cannabis-based medicine. So th- so that's it's really really opening up. Also post traumatic stress disorder um has been approved for a shift a shifting federal policy has been approved for veterans a long time ago actually they, it's okay for them to use medical cannabis if their state allows it and they do not lose their veterans benefits. So that was a great step forward for last year. Yes, and we just uh just recently in the state of Nevada had that uh that as as an added condition for the first one since the inception of the program. So so thank you out there to all the vets. Well, I think it was Dr. Udi that did that. Yes. He, he wrote a letter. See what your letters will get you, folks? Sit down and write one today. Uh, the, the next thing that I'd like to talk about is the return of hemp. The return of hemp. And that's a great thing. I think that a, a lot of our a lot of our problems with recycling, um, with reusable um, products really can be answered with hemp. Oh, it would be nice to see farmers be able to grow a sustainable crop again and, you know, not be told how to grow it either. Well, in Colorado, this guy named Ryan Laughlin, he planted 55 acres of hemp, and it's the first legal hemp crop that's been planted in the United States for over 60 years. Woohoo! So that's a major step forward. Absolutely. Maybe I can stop buying my hemp seeds from Canada. <laughs> Yeah, we we buy uh, we buy edible hemp seeds uh, to put in cookies and stuff like that, and we have to buy them um, from a local store, but they import them from Canada. Is there a lot of excitement about about hemp in uh, California and nationwide, uh, Mark? Are you seeing that? Well, the the farm bill that was recently enacted was a step in the right direction, and has created some excitement, uh, although it limited the uh, production of hemp to production that was conducted through university programs, uh, research programs. But it, but it's an open door that uh, provides a lot of potential. It's worth remembering that hemp, even before uh, the psychoactive 
version of cannabis was outlawed uh, not for its psychoactive properties, which it didn't have at all, but for its potential to threaten the revenues of uh, energy and textile giants in the 1930s. And it was only after that that uh, the concept of uh, reefer madness and the psychoactive portions of marijuana developed. But the, the first efforts at banning marijuana were it was to ban hemp uh, as an uh, anti-competitive measure. So it really, really would be nice for these further steps to happen to allow hemp to be grown commercially because it really is uh, not just medically, cannabis not just medically, but industrially is a miracle plant. It has fuel applications, it has textile applications, it has pulp applications, it has construction applications, all sure. uh, much more sustainably uh, grown than a lot of the other avenues that are uh, th- out there uh, for those industrial uses now. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's quite... Uh, a bit of excitement uh, over that. And in fact, in California, speaking of California developments, the Senate passed through committee a a bill, uh, passed out of committee a bill that would provide for a statewide regulatory system uh, for uh, all sorts of medical cannabis. Oh, good. So uh, we're we're hoping that uh, California, which once was, and and the emphasis uh, on that is once was, Okay. the leader in medical cannabis, can actually catch up to Nevada and other states now in dealing with their statewide systems so we can have a more uniform approach to it. Because one of the things that's really helpful about a well-regulated approach is that you get a uniform supply. That's uh, true. That, that, that's a helpful thing. So it's, it's, a, good, it's a good approach. Uh, it's a good step forward. And hemp is uh, an exciting development in it. And I'd like to, to touch base on something you were mentioning earlier, Jennifer, sure. about the, the CBD issue. Okay. And, and I'm looking at these, these news articles. Wisconsin, Governor Walker signs a CBD-only medical marijuana law. Alabama just signed off on a, a CBD-only medical marijuana bill. Kentucky just signed off on a CBD-only uh, medical cannabis bill. And these are great things. We, the medical benefits of CBD uh, are, are increasingly clear. They're really undeniable, and it's worth supporting. My That's concern true. about that is that it tends to, the states that are doing this are, are implicitly downplaying or uh, eliminating the importance uh, of the Delta 9 aspect of it, and it, it's almost like a weird, subtle reefer madness of, I was well, going to say a knee-jerk reaction, but you're, I think you're you're on track with that reefer madness. It's almost like that that they could they could hook their their little wagon onto this CBD train and feel okay about cannabis because it doesn't get you high. Yeah, and, and, yeah. And this, this whole thing of of not having any psychoactive effect. Okay, look at we we are all I think unified in this concept of of development CD, developing CBD and medical and pharmaceutical-grade cannabis, particularly for the severe conditions, epilepsy. Uh, it may have a great effect on, on other uh, neurological or neurocognitive uh, maladies. Sure. But the fact is, is one of the benefits of uh, cannabis, the Delta-9 aspect of it, is its analgesic quality uh, and the effect it has on appetite enhancement for people suffering wasting diseases. If you're in pain all the time, CBDs will get you to a certain point. Mm-hmm. But if you're really in pain all the time and you're not eating, the CBDs won't get you all the way there. You're, you you kind of need the Delta 9 aspect of that to, to boost the other analgesic and palliative qualities of it. So... I like the fact that these states are moving in the right direction. I'm concerned that this will somehow become a we can use the CBD uh, approach uh, to continue the war on drugs and to continue the failed war on cannabis for its psychoactive properties. Sure, I, I think that I think that maybe it's just seen as like this is how we can get our, our our foot in the door with this CBD issue. We can get the foot our foot in the door, but I I have concerns right along with you that is it at the detriment of the of the medicine in general, 
if we're just taking this one little piece and, and we're saying, okay, this is great and we can all get on board with the CBD thing, but is it closing the door on the THC aspect? You know. Well, then what it does is it implicitly stigmatizes the use of the THC, the Delta, what I call the Delta-9 component sure. of medical cannabis use, so that uh, the, the, the concern that I have, and certainly we get the foot in the door wherever, wherever we can, but we have to be vigilant to make sure that that foot doesn't implicitly stigmatize uh, other medical uses. Yeah, I mean, they, we're, just, we're just discussing all these major points and, and, and you know, and the CBD is like is like one of those things where everybody can grab a hold of it and feel good, and that and I think that's why I mean Utah just passed the the CBD law, um, what about a month or two ago, and it's like okay we've given people a reason that they can feel good about about cannabis, um, but not but we don't I mean we don't want to stigmatize the Delta Nine of course well, you know you know if they embrace the THC they'll feel good too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. That is true. Um, one of our other points, our major points, uh, Uruguay makes history. Uruguay makes history being the first country to legalize a national marketplace for marijuana. They, they were citing frustrations over failed attempts to stem the drug trade. So here's a smart president. So um, President Jose Mirica signed the law handing over the government responsibility to oversee the new uh new industry um he's also been nominated for this year's nobel peace prize for his part in in, in work in legalizing the plant they're trying to undercut the black market which which a lot of violence um accompanies the black market uh, both in south america and mexico and of course here um, and, and so Uruguay has seen the light in legalization to take the black market away from, you know, the black market away from uh, the criminals. Um, their starting price, now get this, Kurt, a dollar a gram. That's the way it should be. <laughs> and I'd like to point out it's about time that somebody wins the Peace Prize that's doing something related with cannabis. Because, I mean, it's been coming since the 1960s. Well, that's a good point. That's a, well, that's, any, any, anything to, that combats the war on drugs, which is necessarily a, an enterprise of violence and oppression, is worthy of consideration for the Peace Prize. And this does a tremendous, it's a tremendous step in that direction. Sure. It, uh, our next point is Obama says that pot is no more dangerous than alcohol. He admits to being a cannabis user in his youth. Can you imagine where he would be today if he was arrested instead of just bragging about it later? <laughs> Um, on that point, if, if it's so much more dangerous yet, uh, I have a news story that recently the U.S. government re, uh, reveals it has approved a powdered alcohol called Pelcohol. Pelcohol? Pelcohol, yeah. So, it, you know, cannabis use is less dangerous than alcohol, but yet the U.S. government is approving powdered alcohol. You'll be I, able to snort a line of alcohol. I love it. That's exactly what the maker said. The maker said, yes, you can snort it, and you'll get drunk almost instantly because alcohol will be absorbed so quickly in your nose. Good idea? No. It'll mess no. you up. <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, you so know. As if alcohol wasn't bad enough already. Now, now we've we got to make it to where it messes you up even faster. <laughs> well, I was going to say, you know what, and you could be like snorting a line in the bathroom and it's not going to have the same impact. <laughs> yeah, and then how are they going to tell the difference if they're snorting a line of alcohol or a line of cocaine at the bar? Is it okay to snort a line of alcohol at the bar? Well, I don't I think... Suppose, you, I, don't I think suppose you, it depends on how fast you talk. <laughs> That's true. And I don't think that you can bring your own alcohol into the bar. So snorting a line off the bar, they might say, you need to take your booze and get out. <laughs> then you'd have to scrape it up with your credit card and put it in a little bindle, huh? <laughs> oh, my goodness. So this alcohol comes in a cosmopolitan mojita and a powderita that says tastes just like a margarita. What this stuff is aimed at is going to a concert or a sporting event or some type of uh, some type of place that's charging you 10 and 15 dollars a beer so you just go in there and you order the four dollar water and 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 dr and uh, dump your little alcohol in there so, so it's a product uh not only is it a bad product that makes a alcohol buzz come on faster it's it's designed to undercut legitimate business people's profits sounds like black market to me uh, no it's not black market because the u.s government says it's okay oh 
Oh, well, that makes all the difference. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So, so I, I don't know if I'm. I don't think I'm going to be trying a powderita anytime soon. Um, but I guess one of their tips on here, which I thought I thought actually was cute, is to sprinkle it on guacamole, <laughs> or it says rum on a barbecue sandwich. I don't know about this. Or vodka on your eggs in the morning. Oh my goodness. Oh my I suspe- goodness. I suspect that once the, uh, a clear mind. Uh, look at this. They're going to reverse their decision. Um, I think. I think already it's they're regretting the decision. It said that the U.S. Alcohol, Tobacco, Tax, and Trade Bureau rubber stamped alcohol, and but they made the decision public without any um, without any of the manufacturers of alcohol realizing it had been a- approved. Oh my goodness. So basically, they just said, "Okay, this is good for you. That's all right." Yeah, sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. Let me let me snort a line of vodka. <laughs> Apparently, they didn't put that through the scrutiny that they've put uh, medical cannabis through. Yeah, I doubt it. Yeah, well, I doubt sure. it because you know we we tend to glorify alcohol use in this society, and you know, and you know. Yeah, I mean, I I was watching a morning program the other day with like Huda or Huda somebody. Huda, oh, it's Hoda and Kathy or Cat. And in the morning, and, and they were drinking like cosmopolitans. I think we should have prohibition against alcohol and alcohol in general. But, you know, I think a lot of alcoholics would go nuts. Um, the next thing that we should talk about probably that about marijuana has come last, a long way since last 420 is that Eric Holder is cautiously optimistic about legalizing cannabis. The, Eric, the Holder memo... Um, the Holder said that the Department of Justice would be happy to work with con- uh, Congress to reschedule marijuana, and it has been clear that the administration won't push the issue without a- issue or action from the lawmakers. What do you think about this, uh, Mark? Well, I think uh, given the gridlock in Congress and, and the, the basically the failure of the system and the political system in Washington, one should not expect any progress on that one from Congress soon. But it is very encouraging that uh, the Attorney General is stating policy that reflects the reality on the ground, namely that uh, well, a reg- well-regulated cannabis industry is something that the federal government should not necessarily punish or oppose. But to, to think that Congress is going to uh, do anything uh, under the current uh, situation um, is uh, it's unlikely uh, that is going to have to come from the states. And my take on that, which I think I've shared before, is is a Tenth Amendment argument by the states that's going to have to push the federal government into realizing that uh, the their ability, their constitutional ability to enforce the Controlled Substances Act on the states with respect to a state-regulated industry uh, may be in jeopardy. And the sooner that that can happen, then maybe that will create the political will uh, in Congress. But uh, I think only the threat of a diminution of federal authority in that regard would have any effect politically in Washington. Okay, Mark. Um, well, we're going to hold on that thought and go on a break, and we'll be right back uh, with Nevada Cannabis News Hour. The Vaughn Dank Group offers turnkey solutions for all your cannabis needs, bringing transparency and responsibility to a young budding industry. Helping patients by producing the cleanest, safest, and most potent medicines and infusibles possible. The Von Dank Group is a design, management, and consulting corporation with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge of the dispensary, edibles, infusible kitchen, and large-scale cultivation of cannabis manufacturing facilities. Let the Von Dank Group help you grow your cannabis business from seed to green. www.vondank.com Do you need help getting your Nevada medical marijuana card? Dr. Reefer is now accepting new patients. There are no medical records required. We have a doctor on staff to give you a thorough physical examination. There is a 99% approval rate for patients. They also have a money-back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Free consultation is available. Call 702-428-0000. 702-428-0000. To get your Nevada Medical Marijuana card today. 
You're listening to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. The phone lines are open at 731-1230. Now, here again, your host, Jen Solis. Hi, this is Jennifer Solis. Um, we are at KLV, 1230 a.m. If you'd like to call in and, uh, and remark on today's show, our phone number is 702 702- 731-1230 or 866-820-5528. We are back from a break and joining us is Kurt Dukach, Beach Baker. And from California, we have Mark Terbeek from the law offices of Terbeek Law Office. H- hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> hello. Hey, we're glad to be back. All right. Um, the I guess the next thing I'd like to talk about are... Um, Christian leaders are calling it for an ending of the drug war and mass incarceration. And also that people are people are speculating that sentence reform may be a move toward legalization. Um, first off, I'd like to talk about the Christian leaders and, uh, as Easter uh, has just passed, Christian leaders called for the U- United States to end the drug war and mass incarceration of offenders. And they're not just talking about cannabis here. I think that they're talking about about all drugs. Um, they say that policies in this failed dr- drug war, which in reality is a war on people who happen to be poor, primarily black or brown, that's a stain on our image as a society. And this comes from Reverend John E. Jackson, uh, senior pastor at Trinity United church of christ in gary indiana so everybody um everybody from the indiana to california to to texas to who was that who was that christian leader that came out and said that he believed in cannabis reform recently like pat robertson or something I'm not sure nobody well, what this shows you uh, i think is it, it's a good example of a of a moral argument that is finally gaining Sway among the non-crazed uh, Christians, and and we have to keep in mind that uh, when you're talking about the Christian uh, community, if you will, uh, there it's worth distinguishing between the crazed um, uh, guys that uh, show up with "God hates fags" signs at military funerals, sure, you know, those types, and ordinary Christians who really tend to want to find out what Jesus would have done, you know, the whole what would Jesus do crowd, all right? And on that level, they're really beginning to develop a serious consciousness, again, almost in tandem with marriage equality, that this is a moral issue, and it's, a, and it's one that Christians have an identity about and should have an identity about, and particularly when you're talking about the effect of the war on drugs, the disparate treatment uh, on communities of color and uh, communities who are not wealthy, uh, the, the two-level system of justice that has developed around the drug war, it becomes a, a plain moral issue, and it's easy to come down on the side of, let's stop this drug war. Well, I, I, you know, people, I think sometimes even Christians need to be reminded that Jesus Christ was about challenging unjust systems that had been held by individuals and um, marginalized communities in bondage. Um, Jesus wasn't for the rich folks and wasn't for the people that were lending the money. He was actually, um, he was actually, you know, of the people and, and down with the people. I mean, he was even, he was even looked down upon by some of the priests because he didn't keep the holy day holy, you know, um, with his actions that should have been, you know, followed different laws. But he said, you know, these these are my actions and these are, you know, these are the laws of my father. And it, Jesus, was, you know, stuck up, stuck up for people of color and people that were downtrodden and people that were marginalized by society. And it wasn't just about what you wear to church every Sunday um, and, you know, and who you can look down upon. And I think that a lot of mainstream Christians are kind of now you know, looking at that and saying, you know, if, if it's a natural plant that has been on this earth that God put on this earth and that's been used for thousands of years, um, you know, that, that it's actually a good thing. Yes, it was, uh, it was Pat Robertson back in uh, March of 2012, so two years ago, and he came out and he said, I really believe we should treat marijuana the way we treat beverage, the alcohol. 
Uh, he said he never used marijuana and don't intend to, but it's just one of those things that I think the war on drugs hasn't succeeded. And then later in the interview, he came to say, I believe in working with the hearts of people and not locking them up. Well, that's, that's, and that's a great statement. Um, you and know, if you can get to a guy like Pat Robertson on that issue, then, uh, then you know that the worm has turned. <laughs> Well, you know, millions of baby boomers are are kind of, you know, in power right now, and there, a lot of them are changing the law. But also people are just getting sick of the statistics like the United States incarcerates more of its population than any other country in the world. We have 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's incarcerated. That outranks even China and Russia and all other countries. This is that that when I heard that statistic, it shocked me. I said, "This is America, you know, the land, land of, the, of free. the free land." You who, yeah, <laughs> land of the not so free. If you want to break other, you know, if you want to break some laws that people think, you know, are good for you, um, and large, largely all of these people have been incarcerated um, because of drug related crimes. Twenty five thousand of uh, those people, drug related convictions in federal courts each year are from drugs 45 percent of those are for lower level offenses and that that maybe they've had multiple offenses and now it's turned into a bigger crime um you didn't re- recently like california uh take back their three strikes law because because it was filling the jails really quickly they amended it to uh take out low-level nonviolent offenses California for the longest time, it was this uh, really draconian sort of any third strike felony offense uh, would have provided you a, a one-way ticket to the big house, and there were numerous instances of people, you know, stealing $12 shoes uh, for their third offense. Uh, and of course, this disproportionately fell on communities of color and poor communities. So. Uh, it was nice to see that there was a back off of that. There's, I mean, there's the incarceration trends um, in America today point to one in every three black males born in America today can expect to go to prison at some point in their life. That's a scary statistic to me. When they talked about the stop and frisk law in New York and and places like that where they would stop and they would search people and tell them to empty their pockets and you know and then bust them for whatever they had in their pockets the problem with this in new york was that they were tar- targeting people of color they weren't targeting uh, you know uh, you know white males wall that street are coming Parker. off of wall street and asking them to empty their pockets and looking at the cocaine or or something that they or their cannabis there or whatever the, the case may be but they were racially profiling people and asking them and stop and frisking them um that that stopped to a large extent, the the search and the search and frisk stop to a large extent, but people are still unaware that it that it that it's been repealed or has been stopped or there's a memo to come down, and so certain cops are still doing this to people of color and and you know and getting their quotas or whatever else um, maybe. I think that we should do three strikes out on politicians who vote against uh, cannabis. Hey, there you go. Let's get that on the ballot. <laughs> I think that I'll talk to yeah. I think I'll talk to a, a politician about that. Can can we get this? Or we would have to do what would we have to do? A signature ballot to get that on the on the well, ballot. Well, that would probably be the best uh, route because I don't think you're going to get the uh, yeah, politicians themselves ballot, introducing any legislation that costs them their Together job. Together we can do it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I mean we can get we can get a signature a signature uh, a signature sheet going about that but i don't think you're right i don't think that we're going to find any politicians who will who will champion that for us well, i don't know maybe michelle fiore might <laughs> well it's interesting that you bring up the uh, the concept of that uh, differential treatment i i told uh, council member barone and i think i'm going to leave it with this uh the the story of something sure. happened to me about 30 years ago when i was fresh into into california i hooked up with a black guy we burned one in the golden gate park this other dude came out of nowhere, showed us a bag. There was mushrooms in it. I opened the bag, showed it to the friend, my Afro-American friend, 
and uh, realized it was it was magic mushrooms. Didn't have the money to buy it. Gave it back to the guy who handed it to us. Vroom vroom! A motorcycle cop comes from out of nowhere, busts us both. Me, the charges were dropped against me. The charges weren't dropped against the the brother. And uh, today I'm a lawyer uh, with a nice successful practice. I bet you he's not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, I experienced the same the same type of behavior in my community. Um. I'm Hispanic. Some of my cousins were Hispanic, dark skin, dark hair, and we're walking down the road, and you know they get busted, and I and they don't even look at me. You know, blonde hair does a lot for you, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And that's hor- you know, that's horrible. But that they gave me a really good sense of injustice because I'm hanging around with all these people, and they're getting busted, and I'm not. And what's the difference? What's the only difference? You can pass. Oh, I can pass. I, I would certainly say it's I'm not sneakier because I'm, I'm a really bad liar. But, uh, yeah, that's and, and that's just a shame in America today. It is. It's the continuing um, tragedy uh, of, of the American system is the institutionalization of these racial and class abnormalities. And hopefully the end of the drug war, the beginning of the end of the drug war, is the beginning of a movement to correct some of this stuff. I, you know, I certainly hope so. I certainly hope that I certainly hope that America can kind of wake up and see that we're being used, and and all these people that are being incarcerated are going to private prison systems, and people have stocks in those private prison systems, and and those people are the people that are benefiting for from the people going to jail. Nobody should should benefit from people going to prison except for that they've been removed from society for acting violent, or, or you know, or being you know totally violent and inappropriate people shouldn't profit off of people being incarcerated for years multiple years and not getting you know and not getting parole or you know out well for those people who who are listening it, it even if you're not if you if you don't ever think you're going to be subject to the prison industrial complex you have to realize that it's gotten so out of control that it takes resources away from your kids, your nephews, your nieces, your grandchildren's education, your health care, the roads that you're on. It, it is an increasingly uh, consumptive infrastructure that is not productive. It doesn't produce anything. It's, it's counterproductive, uh, but because it makes a lot of money for private interests that can then contribute to the politician's campaign, it has an inordinate amount of influence in our system. Uh, but it does negatively affect everybody, including those people who never think they're going to go to prison. Well, can I ask one last legal question? If a police officer owns stock in a private prison system, does that make him a- an agent for that prison system? Technically, no. Uh, the stockholders are not uh, uh, agents for the corporations in which they hold stock. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'd like to also point out, you know, a lot of people think, oh, yeah, it's a private prison system, so we're not uh, sporting the bill. We are. For every single person in there, your taxes are still going to those corporations that are running the prisons. So. To be sure. Mm-hmm. Be sure. Well, we're going to wrap up today's show, and if you like today's show, you can listen to us on KLAV 1230 every Tuesday at from 4 to 5. And if you missed part of it, we have our we have a rebroadcast. We have a, an account account that you can hear it at www.wecan702.org. Look for radio broadcasts. And until next time, you guys be safe out there.